Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good morning to all. Okay, uh, first of all, I would like to thank all of you here for joining me today. Uh, also, thank you to the organizer, Office of the NCPI, for giving me this opportunity uh, to share uh, the research work that uh, we has, as a team has conducted at ARI. Uh, so, let me just uh, present my PowerPoint slide. All right. Okay. So uh, today, what I would like to talk about is about this uh, investment fraud, which is called a Ponzi scheme. Okay. Uh, so my title is Ponzi Proof Your Investment. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Okay. Maybe uh, some of us here have not heard of the term Ponzi, but if I say a uh, get rich quick scheme or scheme cepat kaya, then maybe a lot of people are familiar with it. Right, so before I continue further, I would like to uh, just mention here that this research has been sponsored by Ari Grant and also uh, the co-researchers in my team, uh, Dr. Norlaila Matsin, who is currently the fellow at ILD, and uh, Puan Hazlina Muhammad Fadil, a faculty of law lecturer, both of them are from UITM campus Seremban. Okay, let me start with this basic question okay why do people invest okay so why people invest i think uh, usually we get response like okay, people invest because they want to create wealth right so for so many reasons for example uh, people want to uh, maintain a certain uh, lifestyle or they want to uh, prepare for their children you know or they want to uh, retire uh, uh, well, with the amount of uh, returns they get from their investments. Okay. But uh, not all investments will lead to wealth, especially if you join a Ponzi scheme, right? Okay, why is that? This is because a Ponzi scheme can cause financial leakages to occur. What we mean by financial leakage is that instead of the money or the savings from the investor, used to create actual wealth or use in real investments, these are being leaked to perpetrators or whom we call the Ponzi schemers for their own benefit. Okay, So therefore, if this is not, uh, if this is left unchecked, it may grow exponentially and it will be a damage not only to the people involved, to the individuals or the victims, but can also damage uh, the, the financial system as well as the economy. Okay, my next slide is uh, showing you here, sharing with you some of the statements that uh, maybe we have seen before. Okay, ingin jana pendapatan, pendapatan express. Uh, you can earn money without finding people. You can earn money without actually selling products. And also sometimes you will be uh, enticed by this statement saying that uh, I have done it, I have joined the scheme, uh, but when are you going to do the same? The question is, are these too good to be true? Okay, so it is too good to be true to some people. Okay, however, if uh, for some other people who are desperate to get extra income uh, to make ends meet, this can be actually a good opportunity for them to generate income, right? So think about the situation that we are facing now. For example, with COVID-19, okay? People are losing their jobs and we're not even uh, uh, fully completed our recovery period, but there are so many uh, jobs that have been lost, okay? They might have a uh, commitment that they have to pay credit cards, their housing loans, their vehicle loans, their personal loans. So how are they going to survive, right? So these are the things that we need to look at. Okay, the term Ponzi itself comes from this uh, man. Okay, this is uh, Mr. Charles Ponzi. He was actually, uh, this happens very long time ago uh, in the 1980s, 1920s. He was actually uh, an Italian immigrant to the U.S. Um, he was poor in the beginning, but after uh, some time, he managed to set up his business. 
and from his business he also managed to get some profits however at one point in time he wanted to earn more money from his business so he devised a scheme which is uh, of course at that time he didn't name it Ponzi scheme but it was his scheme whereby he would invite people to invest uh, money to contribute to my money to him and he promised a very high return okay for example it was reported that uh, he promised the investors uh, 50% within 45 days so that is considered as abnormally high returns and also he mentioned there was no risk involved so what happens was that when the investors gave him money instead of really investing the money he was actually paying his earlier investors coming from the new investors the money was paid to the earlier investors so these earlier investors of course they are happy they thought that they have received the return that has been promised and of course ponzi also he got some of the money for himself okay so when people started to get these so called returns so actually make people more convinced and as new investors come in so the scheme prospered however up to one point uh, the cycle couldn't continue anymore because they cannot have new investors so at that time the scheme collapsed so in 1920 he was uh, arrested and he was uh, put to prison for uh, for 2 years if i'm mistaken okay so ponzi scheme how do we recognize one is that it offers a very high uh, rate of return little or no risk actual in uh, actually they are paying uh, the earlier investors with the new investors money and in order to survive they need constant flow of new money okay when i talk about ponzi this is the case that is considered the largest so far okay uh, involving this uh, very influential person in wall street his name is bernie madoff so his scheme was called bernie el madoff investment securities or blmis and the estimated loss or the financial leakage estimated from his scheme was staggering 65 billion dollars so imagine how many people have contributed to his schemes how many people have been affected when the scheme finally collapsed and interestingly he was not like ponzi ponzi was not so well known perhaps compared to him and uh, he was actually a former chairman of nasdaq he was a vice chairman of national association of securities dealers as well as a former advisor to the securities exchange commission in the us i mean if we were in the situation we know about his scheme wouldn't we also uh, uh, trust him because of his reputation however of course with ponzi scheme it cannot last forever so over actually uh, many years he managed to get money from the paper people but eventually when he couldn't do it people start asking money back so that's when he actually turned himself in and now he's in prison and by the way he is still alive uh, this year alone he asked for an early release because of health reason but the uh, the court uh, refused to give him an early release so this give us uh, uh, an idea that perhaps in the us they're very tough on people who who are actually the fraudsters of on this scheme okay so in malaysia itself as uh, we have this famous case last time in the 70s and 80s which was called uh, pak mantelo scheme right i think many of us if you were teenagers like me uh, around those times we must have heard about that scheme okay the estimated loss from uh, pak mantelo scheme was actually uh, large it was 99 uh, million ringgit so it was not a small amount and it's uh, it's worrying when we we think about like recently in 2017 what i have here is a news clipping the pdrm reported that nearly 1 million people have become victims of investment fraud okay with an estimated loss nearly 4 billion ringgit and the other clip, uh, newspaper clipping i have here just to highlight 1% can lose about 150000 
Eh, just because this person was involved in uh, a scheme, uh, um, supposedly was selling coffee. Okay. So there is a problem, right? Why do people still so many people uh, falling for these type of schemes? All right. So these people, when they become the victims, they will be affected not only financially, but sometimes they will be affected emotionally, psychologically. So we cannot just ignore these things, uh, uh, you know, uh, without uh, proper actions taken to fight the uh, Ponzi scheme. Ponzi scheme, as we have seen, it causes a lot of losses, which we call financial leakages. And if it is not uh, going to be regulated, if no action is taken, we are afraid that this kind of financial leakages will uh, increase more and more over time. We can also affect investors' confidence to invest in Malaysian uh, market. And uh, from a closer look uh, into the issue, we also notice that we 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 have no in Malaysia we have no specific law in not in fact not just in Malaysia in some other countries also there's no specific law on Ponzi scheme per se. So in effect, uh, these kind of frauds cannot be legally framed as Ponzi scheme. It can't, cannot be uh, easily detected as Ponzi scheme and Ponzi scheme and therefore actions or speedy uh, response from authorities might not be there. So based on these uh, problems, okay, our study aims to identify the influencing factors uh, to characterize the, characterize the modus operandi used to profile the victims and the fraudster, as well to examine uh, the current prevention measures that uh, we use, okay, the authorities use to prevent Ponzi schemes. Okay. Let me just share with you, uh, this is from our findings, okay, victim X. Um, this is like a classic case of Ponzi scheme. Uh, victim X uh, joined a scheme a few years ago. He took out about 5,000 ringgit from his EPF and gave it to one of uh, the trusted friend, okay, because this friend suggested the scheme to him. And with the promise of around 100,000 return. Okay, so this ex has have a history of joining get rich quick schemes before, but even though uh, didn't manage to get any returns earlier, it didn't deter him from entering this scheme. Okay, as far as the transaction is concerned, the deposit was made to a personal bank account and there was no black and white proof of the transaction. And he was enticed into this scheme because he, he was told, okay, uh, there's this one slot available for you. You know, uh, if you don't take this slot, then you will miss out. So it gives him some kind of, you know, uh, idea that, okay, I should join this. Other people have, have done the same, so I don't want to miss out, right? So what happens is that this trusted friend is uh, to, to this victim X is acting as the leader. So the role of the leader here is apart from taking the money, the leader is also the person who feeds information constantly to victim X. Because victim X will ask also the leader, when am I going to get the money? So the leader will come up with excuses after excuses why the money is still not there. For example, reasons given is that Oh, the money is in the process, but then because of PRU, uh, we are not able to uh, give it to you, or something like that. Okay, so based on that, okay, as an illustration, that actually brings our attention of what are the factors that can influence people to join Ponzi scheme. Now, our uh, study uh, it identified three main factors. One is affinity, trust, and lastly, financial knowledge. What do we mean by affinity? Okay, affinity is when the victims and the perpetrators belong to the same close-knit community. Okay, it's the same group. It can be as simple as a family. It can be also as a working group. Okay, work, for example, us colleagues working in the same place, right? So because uh, affinity is there, 
because of this uh, small group actually the the relationship is already built between the members and if the perpetrator is also within that group he or she can easily exploit interpersonal trust which is already existing uh, uh, in within that affinity group okay so uh, that's actually what happened to medov whereby uh, uh, he used his uh, family ties and his friends uh, as people who are supporting his scheme right so what is related also to affinity is the factor trust okay so trust plays a role to build uh, uh, sorry uh, the perpetrators need to build trust and also needs to maintain trust okay why do they need to build trust of course they need to convince people to uh, join the scheme isn't it things like they will do uh, for example they can post uh, on social media uh, how well they are doing their wealthy lifestyle posing in front of luxury cars and so on so this kind of things actually trying to build the trust and confidence uh, uh, among the poss possible victims okay and on top of that trust is also used to maintain uh, the perpetrators also need to maintain trust within the scheme uh, because they don't want people leaving the scheme because if people start to leave the scheme they are going to ask for their investment or their money back so that is not good for the Ponzi schemer okay so they need to maintain that's why like in the case of victim X the leader's role is to actually feed information to victim saying that don't worry you still need to wait some you know uh, uh, good things comes to patient people so things like the motivation for people to maintain in the scheme and also with trust that actually will um, cause people to not do checking yeah, before they invest that means they compromise due diligence Due diligence means you need to check whether the investment is legitimate, uh, is there real business going on, is there a real company, and so on. Okay, so that is a, a main one of the main factors, trust. The other factor is a financial knowledge. Maybe to us, we might think that people who join Ponzi scheme are those lacking financial knowledge. Actually, financial knowledge that influence people to join scheme here means there are two possibilities. Okay, from our findings, uh, when we interviewed uh, among the regulators, it was mentioned that some people, yes, they are completely ignorant of the this kind of financial matters. So, which means that uh, they are they couldn't evaluate properly whether the investment is worthwhile or not, whether it's legitimate or not. So. It could possibly be because these are among the people who are desperate to make ends meet. They don't know much about financial matters. They might need to save their, for example, their, uh, okay, uh, they, they have to pay a big commitment uh, of debt and so on. So they join. But the other type of victim is also people having financial knowledge. Okay, so we cannot say that uh, people not having uh, having financial knowledge will always be free of, from becoming victim. They can be, especially when they think they know how the system works. They want to try their luck. Okay, and it is possible also that greed comes into place here. That means induced by greed, so they join the uh, scheme. So these are the common types of investments uh, used by Ponzi schemers. Okay, these are the names of investments commonly used to promote their their schemes. For example, forex trading. Okay, uh, nowadays you will find that even the youngsters they are very keen on uh, getting money out of forex trading. Right. The other thing, cryptocurrency. Uh, almost everywhere people already know. A little bit at least about Bitcoin have heard of it okay gold investment scheme not saying that gold investment is illegal but it can be used to entice people to join the scheme same thing with commodity investment scheme for example uh, kopi or kayu gaharu 
uh, okay and then property investment scheme whereby uh, it could be the case where uh, a scheme promises to build houses with low cost but we as the investor we need to put in money first right so after a few year, few years we should get the 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 house uh, things like that okay multi level marketing and also recreational membership scheme okay if we look at the modus operandi okay this is uh, how it is being conducted in this digital era we find that uh, as as documented here by interpol 2019 investments are promoted using digital platform right so from there investors were invited or were asked to open trading accounts and then the investors are put uh, in contact with perpetrators to convince the victims normally there will be a way for the schemers to show quick gains which are virtually announced so that can be very attractive but how can you tell that it's real Okay, and that's how the victims are persuaded and pressured. We also need to take into account of the modus operandi, uh, for example, okay, companies, uh, because they know that if they want to convince people, they need to show that their company is registered. So what they do is, they register it with Suruhan Jaya Syarikat Malaysia, but they do not go all the way to get license from Securities Commission or Bank Negara Malaysia. So in a way, that's how we can check whether it's legal or illegal. Okay. The other thing that we need to be aware of is that these schemes normally, or some of these schemes, they have a, a marketing plan with elaborate packages available. Okay, for example, if you want to invest a little, you can, or if you want to invest more, you can also uh, choose a, a different package. So these are common uh, methods used. Apart from that, uh, uh, schemers also, they use public figures, uh, sometimes a spokesperson, okay, celebrities, and VIPs. Now, VIPs, uh, sometimes they just use the name, you know, the petik je nama, orang ni, orang ni. So, some people might be gullible enough to think that, yeah, it is true, okay? Uh, and, and they say that uh, things like this are secretly done. Uh, for example, the investment, uh, they cannot uh, give information banyak-banyak because this is high profile and so on. So, kita pun, we don't want to ask so many questions, right? So, because of the trust there, we tend to believe. And also, there is also a trend of using religion, okay, ethnicities, ethnic ties, uh, especially within affinity group to persuade investors. You use uh, apa, something like, oh, kalau kita kaya, kita boleh bayar lebih banyak zakat, you know, uh, things like that. So, we have to be aware of this modus operandi. Coming to the victim's characteristics, although there are so many schemes out there, but actually we can look at common characteristics among the victims, okay? Uh, for example, people who just receive windfall, contoh pesara ataupun uh, people who just got money from EPF, but boleh keluar duit from EPF, okay? So these are the usual targets for the Ponzi schemers. Other than that, these victims also, they trust, they rely on trusted individuals, okay? And they belong to affinity group. They are also um, uh, mostly gullible. Gullible ni maksudnya dia senang kena tipu, okay? And the financial knowledge just now, whether they have financial knowledge or perhaps they also lack financial knowledge, both of them can be actually uh, uh, their characteristic for the victims. For the fraudsters pula, okay, uh, normally when you have this scheme going on, there will be this person, this con man, and the con man ni orang yang menipu tu, okay, so this con man, uh, he is in direct, uh, sorry, this con man is in direct communication with the investors. So usually also from our findings, uh, we found out that Normally, there is a mastermind behind the con man, okay, behind the scheme. So the mastermind is re is the person who is responsible to devise the plan uh, thoroughly. 
And then the con man with the excellent public relation, that means the con man is able to give good reputation, good image to the investor, and then also good communication skill, can speak fluently, you know, can talk about uh, many things, uh, very persuasive. So they are able to uh, deceive people. And interesting, th interesting also, some of the fraudsters uh, were prior victims. So it could be that they learn the trick first, okay? They know how the Ponzi scheme can work, and so they try it on others. So these are among the profile of the fraudsters. So all the things that uh, I've talked about just now, actually there is a link with this uh, gullibility theory. So gullibility theory is by Greenspan 2009. And for your information, Greenspan himself was a victim of Bernie Madoff's scheme, right? So he was actually a psychologist, but um, somehow he was also, uh, uh, you know, lured by the, the scheme. Uh, but he later come up with this theory whereby there are four things that can uh, induce people to engage in positive scheme. One is situation. Situation means, um, like, let's say I am in a group of friends. I see that all my friends are already doing it. So I feel like, oh, if they are doing it, must be it is a correct thing to do. Okay, it is a right thing to do. So I am in that situation which leads me to join the Ponzi scheme. Cognition is talking about how well I know about financial matters, as I've discussed just now. Personality looks at whether what type of person I am. Okay, because some people they are more trusting than others. So it could be that this personality brings about the, the reason for them to join the Ponzi scheme. And emotion is talking about um Usually we talk about greed, okay? Uh, because of greed, people join Ponzi scheme. But it is not only greed. According to Greenspan, people also join Ponzi scheme because they fear, they have fear, okay? fear of losing security, fear of losing income, and so on. So ironic, isn't it? So they, because they fear they lose income, they join the. Okay, so now we turn to the prevention measures. Uh, from our findings, uh, the prevention measures are led by three key uh, activities, okay? Uh, one is the regulation. So the regulation, enforcement, as well as education. For the regulations, we have Bank Negara Malaysia, as well as the Securities Commission. Bank Negara Malaysia is also involved in enforcement. Uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, Police Diraja Malaysia is the main uh, law enforcer here. And uh, we can see that uh, all three entities uh, here, BNM, Securities Commission, SPDRM, they are good in uh, educating the public. Okay? They have done many uh, um, activities or programs to educate the public, which I will share with you later. Okay, now if we talk about regulations, I did mention earlier that there is no specific laws on uh, Ponzi. So what happens is that uh, Ponzi scheme actually can violate several laws. For example, here we have Section 420 of Malaysian Penal Code, Financial Services Act, Anti-Money Laundering, Anti-Terrorism Financing Act, and so on. So in a way, because we have these several laws that, uh, that is used, okay, that can be used to fight Ponzi, therefore, there is no, like, uh, a single law that can actually address Ponzi adequately, right? For example, some people might go to PDRM and they make a complaint, they make a report. And from PDRM, in order to take action, they need to find evidence, is there any cheating being done? Okay? And some other people, they might go to Bank Negara, for example. So Bank Negara, they have to decide, okay, is, is there any illegal deposit taking? So you see, because of this lack of uh, uh, regulation uh, specific for Ponzi scheme, sometimes the speedy action that we need from the authorities is just not there. So that can actually uh, further give room for the Ponzi schemers to continue their schemes. Okay, so here I am sharing with you the prevention action that has been done by Bank Negara Malaysia. Uh, from time to time, they give uh, news uh, in the newspaper, in TV, uh, you know, uh, that is under media coverage. 
but also they do public outreach. That means they go to the community. Um, but um, I think the public outreach, even though it's very good because they can go face to face, communicate with uh, people to prevent people to give warning to people. But uh, I don't think they can do it, um, you know, uh, in a large scale because perhaps they have certain target groups that they want to focus on. But the easier way for us, uh, the public, to get information from uh, Bank Negara and also for them to prevent Ponzi is through their website. Okay, For example, uh, if we uh, click on their website, okay, we can see that they have these consumer alerts and updates. And uh, for example, they have the list of companies and websites updated 31st March 2020. So this is uh, current, okay? So we can actually go to their website and check whether the investment that we are going to enter is legitimate or not. Now, apart from the website, they also have this link. Okay? Link is not a website. Link is actually like a one-stop center whereby they, they have direct communication with public. Uh, because like, okay, for us, if we go to commercial banks, anytime we can go there and, and, and interact with the bank, isn't it? But for Bank Negara, normally, we don't have any uh, concern to go there. But for Link, when they have set up BNM Link, Laman Informasi Nasihat and Khidmat, they actually created uh, an avenue for the public to make a report or to ask questions regarding these uh, investments that they are interested in. So that is a good thing, okay? Uh, apart from that, they also have mobile apps, okay? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure whether you have heard of it or not, but there is one which is called My BNM, and I'm sharing here what they have. It is interesting to see what they have inside the app, okay? Apart from, for example, the alert list that I have here, these are among the things that we can find in the mobile app. We can also find education uh, material. Okay? For example, BNM is using this simple cartoon just to ex explain to us uh, quite simply what illegal deposit taking is. Uh, so these are the kind of things that are available out there. Okay. Now if we look at the second, uh, which is Securities Commission, they also have their uh, website, Investor Alert, similar to Bank Negara, and they also publish a list of unauthorized websites or investment products or companies or individuals here. So it's a matter of going to their website and clicking and you can get a lot of information there. Other than that, they also have the InvestMart here. Okay, InvestMart here is their effort to, to uh, give information so that investors will become protected investors. Here I have also uh, take note of uh, some of the uh, photos that they uh, published uh, in order uh, people wanted by the Securities Commission. Okay, so what about PDRM? So PDRM is the law enforcer PDRM actually has uh, this one specific department, uh, Commercial Crime Investigation Department, which uh, uh, acts to monitor, they compile statistics, as well as to identify the modus operandi of investment scams. Okay, so apart from that, they, they also have alerts. For example, if we look at on this right hand side, okay, this is what we can get from the social media, which is Facebook. And also from their website, this is where we can check the if, if there is any, for example, bank account, which we are not sure, you can put in there and you can check the information. So all these kind of prevention are all very good, okay? But we still need to look at, is there anything that we can do better, right? Of course, the authorities also, uh, they have done a very good job, okay? However, Maybe, for example, us, the public, we also have to do the same, okay? And that's why I think what happens in these uh, Ponzi scheme alert groups, okay? These are just uh, a group of people who are concerned uh, 
uh, with uh, doing a good thing to prevent Ponzi. This is an, in social media, which is on Facebook. Um, in order for you to join this, you need to request to the administration. Okay, but it's okay. It's quite easy for you to uh, join this Ponzi scheme alert uh, group. And I find that this kind of uh, social media uh, information is very, very uh, useful. Okay, because they have daily updates. They always give tips on how to identify uh, Ponzi scheme. What are the red flags that we should be aware of? So. This is a kind of uh, coming from the public themselves, how to prevent uh, the Ponzi scheme. Okay. So as a conclusion, okay, our study found that uh, there are three uh, influencing factors, which are affinity, okay, trust, and financial knowledge. And these three factors are also inconsistent with, uh, what, uh, with Greenspan's theory of gullibility. And these are the things that we should take note of, okay? For example, in the education program uh, that is uh, undertaken by the authorities, they can always stress on this affinity, the trust and the knowledge issues that have actually uh, become an influencing factors for people to join Ponzi schemes. Now, in terms of regulation, we are in need of a proper and specific regulation uh, uh, because also uh, this with, with having a, a law on that, this will give power to the law enforcement to properly enforce the law. For example, they might be uh, given better enforcement tools uh, in order to curb on this scheme. But most important of all is education, right? So we cannot stress more. It, this is very important, the education. When we talk about regulation and enforcement, that is like after, uh, you know, when, when the scheme is already there and have already cheated people, that's the action that we need to take. But when you talk about education, this is like, this is really preventing it. And you we need to have more of these awareness programs, okay? So as we see from our uh, study here, even though the authorities, they have these education and awareness programs, uh, for example, using their websites, uh, the coverage is not that, that, that much, okay? Because it takes a person to really want to click on their website in order to get the information. So, you have to think, we have to think of better uh, uh, awareness program. It needs to be more proactive. Okay, education rather than uh, the passive education strategy that we might have now. Okay, so this kind of awareness program is very important in order, for example, to uh, give information how to identify the red flags and also uh, it will give information on recurring characteristics of the prof profile of the fraudsters, for example, as well as with education, we will be able to encourage victims to notify the authorities. Now, uh, it has been uh, mentioned uh, during the interview that in Malaysia, sometimes uh, the victims are embarrassed, okay? And it is understandable. We are embarrassed if we are uh, the victim of this Ponzi scheme. But think about it. If we stay like that, we are actually supporting the Ponzi schemers. We are not doing anything to break the chain. We have to do something. We have to report this. Even if we have some suspicion, we can always go, as I mentioned just now, uh, BNM link, or maybe we we'll go straight to PDRM and so on. So education is important so much so that we recommend uh, this strategy for preventing a uh, Ponzi scheme which consists of the three elements mentioned, education, regulation, and enforcement. However, it must be, uh, it must be in a coordinated fashion. Uh, and communication of information must be good so that, for example, among authorities, they have, uh, uh, a uh, they have the right information for them to take action. Okay, in terms of education here, as I mentioned, we need the passive education, but we also need to step up on the 
proactive education. Okay, proactive means um, you go and, uh, for example, uh, I would, uh, I like to compare how Malaysia so far has been successful in tackling the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Okay, every, every day we are given the information on how many cases, how many have actually uh, uh, discharged from hospital and so on. So, this information given every day in a rapid manner, which makes that it's easy for people to be aware. But I'm not talking that. Ponzi uh, authorities who are providing Ponzi needs to do the same. Uh, that might not be uh, possible. Okay. However, we still need uh, the the education to be done consistently or regular basis so that more people will be aware. And when talking about education, also since we are in a university, I would uh, I would like to highlight that actually as lecturers we can play our role okay when we are in the class we are interacting with our students we can always uh, give some tips to them uh, for example our students who are going to graduate we can advise them that if they need to invest invest properly how are they how do they need to do it be aware of ponzi scheme because you 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 might find among them they are already doing it Okay, they are already doing it. Uh, we don't know that yet. So, uh, it is possible. So, from the beginning, before they enter into employment, we already notify them of this kind of information. Regulation, as mentioned just now, need a, a better cooperation among the authorities. Okay, and maybe tougher penalties. For example, uh, Bernie Madoff, he was in the US, he was sentenced to 150 years of uh, imprisonment. Imagine at the time that he was uh, uh, arrested, he, uh, uh, actually he uh, he turned himself in. At that time, he was already 71 years old. And if the court gave, let's say, 20 or 30 years, we can expect that it's not long for him to live anymore, isn't it? But just to stress on how serious the, the, the crime was, that court rule that he was to be taken into prison for 150 years so that gives an idea how serious the offense is okay and for the enforcement with the uh, law in place uh, to fight Ponzi uh, scheme they would be uh, in a better position okay with the power to enforce of course uh, it is hope also they could have better enforcement tools so to end my presentation, how to Ponzi proof your investment? First of all, we have to train ourselves to be skeptical. Okay, we cannot just believe whatever information that is fed to us. We cannot believe whatever people tell us. We have to check by ourselves. Okay, that is where the due diligence come in. Apart from that, there are so many alerts that has been published or provided by the authorities. You have to do your own, uh, uh, you know, you have to do your own checking, okay? And lastly, you have to uh, uh, um, make yourself go and report uh, if you become a victim because in that way, you are going to stop the chain of this Ponzi scheme, all right? So I think that's all from me. Uh, thank Bye. you. Bye. Um, Maybe uh, we will uh, open uh, the floor for questions. Um, is there any questions from the participants maybe? Anybody who has written anything? Maybe I'm just going to check. Okay. If not, you can uh, directly ask um, from Dr. Ali. I think it's a good sharing, uh, Prof, uh, because um, um, I think the first thing about this Ponzi scheme is uh, the victims are embarrassed, you know. Okay. Okay. Maybe I can just yeah. uh, answer some of the questions. Yes. Yes. Okay. Please. By Doctor Lian Chi Ying. Okay. Which authorities we should report to when encountering these issues? Okay. You can report to these three uh, entities. Either you report to PDRM or Bank Negara or the Securities Commission. Okay. You can uh, go directly to them and make the report.
Okay, uh, question by Prof. Dr. Jamalia. Uh, this is uh, uh, from Ari. Okay. Uh, what is the biggest Ponzi scheme in Malaysia? Okay, if we talk about uh, biggest Ponzi scheme, for example, in uh, uh, the Swiss cash, okay, uh, probably that is uh, one of the biggest uh, Swiss cash. Uh, I think that was somewhere in 2006 to 2011 where the estimated loss uh, more than 100 million, if I'm mistaken. But from there, about 31 million managed to be uh, returned to the, the victims. Okay, uh, a question here. Can we assume that most of the MLM in Malaysia is Ponzi? Very good question, okay. Uh, okay. Um, uh, I, I do not suggest that we can assume, yeah, because uh, this thing is, uh, but, but what I can share with you is what we got from the findings uh, during our interview with uh, the regulators, okay. They mentioned that basically MLM is illegal, okay. However, uh, they need to look closely into the perhaps the modus operandi, what is going on with the MLM because as you can see MLM can be used as a Ponzi scheme, okay. Uh, so, in order for us to know more whether MLM is actually a Ponzi or not, it's not a simple matter for us to say. Uh, but the regulators uh, in the opinion that MLM is not legal, okay? So maybe we need to go and find out from them if given... Oh, okay. Stop sharing, yeah? <laughs> oh, I forgot to, to stop sharing. Okay, so maybe... Uh, where was I just now? Uh, MLM. Okay, MLM. So maybe you need to go and direct to them to get uh, the information on whether a certain MLM is a Ponzi or not. Okay. Uh, Dr. Aisha, about the other tools to investigate what uh, the tools. Okay, for example, um, can the, for example, the PDRM or other uh, authorities, can they actually shut down uh, the business right after uh, they receive complaint or something like that, for which the tools are not there, for example, okay? So which means that we, we, there, there is a need for a specific law on Ponzi scheme that will actually facilitate the law enforcer to allow them, for example, to take much speedier action. All right. Okay. E emas ETA tok belaga kazana bangsa skim segar dalam ingatan. Okay. Uh, I have no comment on that because uh, you have to actually check. Well, first, okay. First thing is what you can do is you check whether the the company is registered with SSM or not. Okay. If it is not registered in SSM something is wrong there from the beginning. If they mm -hmm. are registered with SSM, then check whether if they are taking deposit from you, are they actually licensed by Bank Negara? Okay, so that all in all, we actually need to check. And actually, I'm happy to share with uh, a lot, uh, many of us here today because it's our intention in this research group, in ARI also, to get as much information to the public in order for the public to become uh, more informed before you make any investment, okay? But of course at ARI, we are more concerned with the financial criminology aspect, the fraud aspect. So we are here to, uh, when we do research, we also uh, are uh, happy to share with others on how prevention can be done, okay? so. It is, uh, uh, I'm happy that a lot of people can join today. So at least something you can bring home when you talk to your children, you know, you can always talk to them. Uh, these are the kind of things that you shouldn't invest in. And it's not difficult to get the examples. You just go to internet, you just put in their Ponzi or scheme and there are so many uh, uh, schemes that, uh, you know, um, that I suspect to become a Ponzi scheme. There's a question from Dr. Rani Diana, Dr. Ali. Yeah. Is there any possibility that the victim will get back their money and since ah. the tendency of the victim to come forward uh, to come forward to the authority? 
Okay, uh, is there any possibility we will get the money? Okay, if we can see, for, for example, like the Swiss cash uh, case, yes, uh, some uh, victims uh, do get their money. But, okay, but the question also is like this. Um, when the victims know that they can get the money back, is it good? Okay, to me, it depends on what type of victims are we talking about. If the victims are people who join Ponzi scheme purely because they need to make ends meet, they were fooled to join the scheme. They are actually, uh, uh, the, the situation they are in is very, uh, a very hard kind of living. So perhaps these people need to be given back the money. But if let's say victims who are actually in the first place, they are accomplices. Okay, For, according to our findings, um, like Bank Negara, they said that some of the victims are considered as accomplices because in the first place, they are joining the scheme with the hope of making money. But when something happens, they start playing victim. Okay, so whether it's fair to give them back the money or not, okay, that that can be discussed further. How about forex? Okay, forex. Now, forex, I don't say that it is illegal, but if let's say the name, the term forex trading is used to entice the investors to say that, okay, this is a forex trading, you can make money so much and so on, then it becomes Ponzi. Going back to the characteristics of the Ponzi scheme, is it like offering you um, uh, abnormally high returns? Is it saying that there's no risk involved? And then with that kind of red flags, then we can say, okay, this might not be the the, the uh, legitimate forex trading. Okay. Okay, apakah kesan kerugian paling teruk ke atas mangsa, emosi, psikologi, material? Okay, uh, from our study, okay, we didn't go much into the psychological effect. Of course, uh, we also uh, acknowledge that because of the Ponzi scheme, uh, when people lost their savings, it can bring a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, effect, negative effect to the uh, individual. Yeah? For example, imagine if you are a widow, you don't have much saving and then you lost your money there. You know, you, uh, it has been said in the Mer Bernie Madoff case, uh, some people were, were so affected that they, they thought of uh, committing suicide. So it's not impossible that those things mm -hmm. are uh, affecting the victims. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question from Pazni Susila. Local companies are easier, but how about non-local companies? Uh, mm -hmm. My experience, not Ponzi scheme, but for example, I'm having a problems claiming back my airline tickets due to the fact that the agent base is in Holland. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay. I'm not so sure whether uh, uh, that is related to Ponzi or not. But if you're talking about the, if you're talking about now with the present situation with COVID-19, uh, it is expected that uh, it's very difficult for us to claim back airline tickets. Okay, especially if you go through an agent. Even I myself. Uh, with Air Asia, uh, I, I also didn't get my refund up until now. Okay, uh, so perhaps uh, 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 maybe it's Ponzi, maybe it's not. But you have to go and check. Okay, Mo, uh, Mr. Masun, I think uh, from Indonesia, right? Okay, how to test that MLM is a Ponzi scheme and illegal business? Again, how to test it? the test is for us, okay, as a public, what we can do is check the legitimacy. We go to the proper authorities. We can go to the uh, alerts which are this, uh, provided by, for example, the security function, by the central bank. Okay, and these are the, the things that you need, you can do as a public. But then, uh, how to test public that is up to the authorities uh, to, to, you know, to determine. Okay, are there any specific enforcements deal with these issues directly without we got through all the troubles? Okay, how do you disseminate this info in classroom? 
Okay, for example, in classroom, uh, I'm an accounting lecturer, okay? So, some of the things that I teach them is like budgeting. So, when I talk about budgeting, I will also explain to them that when they go into employment later, they really have to budget uh, their expenses. Uh, what I observe uh, among our youngsters is that they might nowadays, everybody is living kind of lifestyle which is quite luxury, you know. Uh, sometimes not that they have so much money, but they are, they are uh, because of peer pressure and so on, they, they want to have that kind of uh, standard of living. Okay? Uh, they want to portray that they are, uh, uh, they have a, a good uh, lifestyle. So because of that, they might, when they enter into uh, employment, they might not be able to save, to do some saving or to budget for their expenses. So when this is related, how well they manage their cash, for example. So that is when I will uh, talk to them about, do not, please be aware of Ponzi schemes. Okay? For example, if you have, uh, if you look at the advertisement, it looks too good to be true, please don't do it, uh, things like that. Okay, Dr. Nolaila added, um, she said that according to our findings, sometimes after the cases have been brought to the court with all the evidence in the end, for some reason, yes, the cases were dropped. Okay, so that is quite unfortunate. Okay. Uh, true, uh, uh, Dr. Saiful Ikma, uh, selalunya alert dan list keluar bila dah ramai yang terkena. Yeah, so we have to uh, play our role uh, for uh, encouraging people or ourselves also to go and report on all these things. Okay. I, think the best, I think the best bet is that um, whenever that uh, you are being uh, introduced to this kind of scheme, uh, we have the, you know, the right and you have the responsibility to check um, by ourselves about how to it is and whatnot and to, you know, to refer this to someone someone who is more knowledgeable maybe or to check with the police i don't know uh, from what you have uh, shared i think that's uh, among the things that we should do before we trust uh, yeah. any pon any scheme not not saying that it's ponzi or not because sometimes we do not know until it is you know in the newspaper so i True. think mm, what you yeah. is so relevant that we can take that as a take home note and uh, and be responsible with uh, ourselves and with our money. Okay, thank you. Any other uh, any other questions maybe? Uh, Puan Hazlina, our, our co-researcher also mentioned that yes, information can be given in law classes such as company law uh, under the topic incorporation of companies. Right, right, right. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Ali, just a wrap up uh, for this uh, session. Uh, I think we have covered uh, all the questions that has been stated mm -hmm. in the chat uh, space. Uh, your maybe one or two minutes wrap, wrapping up of uh, for your session this this morning. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Ponzi scheme. Uh, at least I hope that by today everybody know already in this uh, session. Everybody already know about Ponzi scheme. Okay, Ponzi scheme. Before this, people don't know. Uh, so it's uh, essentially it's just like re quick rich scheme. Please do your part in preventing this thing from happening. Uh, we cannot just rely on the authorities to do it. They have done a very good job. Okay, so maybe it's up to us, the public, to do our role. Okay, so I think with that. Uh, uh, I thank you so much for everybody who has joined uh, this session and I hope mudah-mudahan adalah ilmu yang boleh uh, apa, memberikan manfaat yeah. kepada semua yeah. yang hadir pada hari ini. Itu yeah. saja Dr. Cik thank yeah. you thank very much. You. Thank you Dr. Ali, thank you all around insyaAllah. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.